I get, I get the pleasure to um, introduce our next super awesome speaker, <laughs> which is me. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, so again, I'm Greg Kleinines, for those of you that weren't here this morning at 8. Um, and uh, my uh, role in this is helping organize this event, but also um, I've been intimately familiar and involved with water issues in Door County uh, since you know early 2000s, back from when the outbreak happened at Nicolay Bay. Our group has done the beach testing. We work with Coggin and Crossroads uh, to run a water lab. We've done uh, well testing programs. Um, we also run a lab at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh for uh, both surface and, and drinking water analysis. Uh, we do that now for about 17 counties uh, around Wisconsin. And so that provides an opportunity for us to provide a public service, uh, kind of the Wisconsin idea, uh, extending the works of the university to the borders of the state, but also to train students. And so some of those students, one of them, works in the county right now. She uh, graduated a couple years ago. Um, we've had a number of them. They come up here, at, at the gentleman here said he got captured. Um, a lot of us uh, have felt that way. Um, I'm also a Door County property owner. So um, you know, at some point I'll spend hopefully more time uh, up here uh, when work doesn't get in the way. So um, anyway, so the goal of this talk today uh, as we started organizing this, uh, this um, summit, uh, a lot of people asked questions just really in a general way um, about water, not what is water, the molecule H2O and all that, but what, what is the first thing people do in the morning? Okay, so brush your, I was gonna say brush your face, Br brush your teeth, you know, uh, maybe go to the bathroom. Does anybody think twice? Stuff. I mean, as long as long as stuff disappears and stuff comes out of your faucet that's not colored, um, everybody thinks life is good, right? So today, feel free to stop me at any point and ask questions. Um, the goal is to give you a little bit more background about water use in Wisconsin, um, and then also just how do you get the water in your home? Where does it go once you're done using it, both individually uh, in terms of wells, uh, but also on the municipal scale? So um, with that, I just wanted to start with some facts. Um, so 33% of the world's water is fresh water, 2% of that is in the polar ice caps, and that number is decreasing daily. Um, so only 1% of that fresh water um, is actually you know, available to us in sort of lakes and streams. Great Lakes is the largest freshwater system on Earth, and it contains 20% of the world's fresh water. Uh, the U.S. draws more than 40 billion gallons of water from the Great Lakes every day. That's a lot of water. Uh, more than 35 million people rely on the Great Lakes for drinking water. Uh, Wisconsin has more, this should be another bullet point, 15,000 lakes. I don't know if anybody saw the Journal Sentinel article, you know, we were sort of feuding with Minnesota where they th say they're the land of 10,000 lakes and we actually have 15,000 lakes. Um, uh, 13,000 miles of navigable streams and I've been told, and I can't find a reference for this, that Vilas County is the only county in the United States that has more surface area of water than land. There's 1,700 lakes within that one county. So if anybody can find me a reference for that, I would give you extra credit. <laughs> I, I told students one time, I said, hey, they were looking at me all bored, and, and they said, uh, oh, can't we talk about something else? I said, fine, I'll give you extra credit if you can tell me where Kleinheinz Hall was in the UW-Madison campus. So that's why I'm from Madison. And they're like, Kleinheinz Hall? Well, wow, that's gotta be some big biotech building. And uh, they came back and they're like, oh, we found it, it's gone now. I said, I know. And, and, and I said, did you actually find a picture? They said, yeah, it's like a sheep barn. I'm like, yep, that's it. Um, <laughs> more than 800 miles um, of coastline, uh, 200 miles of Mississippi shoreline, 86% of Wisconsin's border, the 1700 mile border is water. Lake Michigan, Superior, Menominee River, um, you go again through Vilas County, a lot of lakes. So that's, that's a pretty significant number, the Mississippi River. 2,400 trout streams, uh, and they stretch 956 miles. Uh, with 28 le lakes, the Eagle River uh, chain of lakes is, is the largest in the world. Um, the assessed value of Lakeshore property in Door County, over $2 billion. Somebody in here probably knows a better number um, whoops, than that. Uh, but that was the most current one. Uh, each person in Wisconsin uses, I thought this was interesting, 56 gallons of water per day. The national average is 90. So we actually use less uh, than most people uh, around the country, but that's still a pretty significant number. What, what do you think most of that 56 is? Toilet. Well, toilet. Do you know what, what for many years, the most, um, the, the biggest contraband item that was imported into the U.S. was? <laughs> Could be. Toilets. 
So when they switched to low volume toilets in the US and mandated that, people wanted their high volume toilets and from Canada they're, they're by the truckload they would bring in toilets. Um, and now it's, you know, now they have no flush toilets. Um, but anyway, oh, back to this, I, I have a tendency to do that. That 56 gallons, so showers um, and, uh, you know, running water, washing hands and those sorts of things. Uh, 1.4 million dairy cows, each cow drinks 45 gallons of water a day uh, to pr produce 100 pounds um, of butter or, or milk in 12 or 12 gallons. Uh, groundwater use in Wisconsin totals 760 million gallons per day. 800,000 private wells. And so in Door County, we're going to talk about this. Where are the only places in Door County you can get water that doesn't come from like a private well? Sturgeon Bay. Sturgeon Bay. Sister Bay. Yep, Sturgeon Bay and Sister Bay. They're only municipal water systems. But interestingly, a lot of the towns all have municipal wastewater. Bailey's Harbor, Ephraim, uh, so on. Uh, seven in ten uh, Wisconsinites, 97% of the state's uh, inland communities depend on groundwater. So even if you're in a municipality, that means you're getting your drinking water from a well and you're getting it from groundwater. Where would you get it otherwise? Yeah, surface water. So if you're on, in Lake, uh, near Lake Winnebago, where we are in Oshkosh or Appleton, they get it from uh, Lake Winnebago or what I affectionately call Lake Winnesepic. <laughs> um, it was funny when Val showed that picture up there, it was all nice and green, and that's kind of what it looks like in August. Um, but uh, in Madison, Wells, uh, if you live along Lake Michigan shoreline, maybe. Um, I think there's a municipality in the, on uh, the Wisconsin River that gets surface water, but by and large, it's groundwater, and we'll talk about why that is. It's not, so, a little bit of it's just convenience, but um, it's, it's just ease of treatment, so. Um, so when we talk about uh, well water, we talk about wells and or well water, and we're going to talk about individuals. So this is at your home. So how many people in here have a well at their home? How many people out of the, wow, that's not as many as I thought. How many people out of that group understand how that works really well? <laughs> well, okay. Well, we're going to have a little quiz later, so we'll see. There's four of you. Um, <laughs> So uh, municipal water comes from, again, a well or surface water. And so we're going to talk about both of those. Um, and then we're going to talk about where it goes. Because if you run water, it disappears and goes somewhere. And it doesn't just dis... And in, in some places, you can drink the same molecule of water several times a week. So we don't have any of those systems in Wisconsin because we're blessed with lots of um, you know, abundance of fresh water. But in places like California, Texas, there are municipal uh, wastewater systems that are directly connected. The end of their pipe, the wastewater pipe, is the influent pipe for the drinking water plant. Um, and so I know that sounds gross, but um, you know. Anyway, so here's a, here's a little bit of a, well, I mean, they, they put me before lunch. <laughs> um, so. For, for good reason, but um, anyway, so this is sort of the, the, the you know the simplistic water cycle. Um, you know, so as as you heard Joel and and Val I think talk about earlier, you know we've got precipitation, um, but really when it comes to to on-site water use, we're really most interested in infiltration and groundwater flow. So this part here where we have surface water infiltrating into the groundwater and groundwater moving, um, and so that's what we're really going to focus on. And when you look at inflows to Lake Michigan, so this is again just sort of a general water phenomenon. Um, I think Joel mentioned it, he talked about precipitation and evaporation, wasn't it him? It was talking about water levels or Val, one of them. Um, and so ice over and things like that that decrease evaporation are things that um, are really uh, significant in terms of uh, water levels. So precipitation, you can no you notice this, precipitation, groundwater discharge to streams and lakes, so, um, and then evaporation and then outfalls to Lake Huron. Those are the big four and you can notice all these diversions, direct groundwater discharge. I mean, a lot of these are really small. And in fact, many years ago, we were working on a project and uh, you could watch as the weather patterns in Door County changed, you would all of a sudden like, so we do all this beach work and you'd notice that the levels of, you know, the barometric pressure would change and it would increase. And then all of a sudden, uh, levels of E. coli at the beaches started going up. And a guy from USGS said, oh, he was a statistician, and he, you, know, you can explain anything with statistics. <laughs> uh, and he said, well, listen, you know, he said, every time the barometric pressure goes up, your E. coli goes up, so you could just use that as a predictor. So I said, oh, that's good. We can eliminate all the other stuff we're doing and just get a barometer. <laughs> but it made really good sense. So what's the one thing you understand about groundwater in Door County? Anybody? 
So the karst geology, so the cracks in the subsurface, it's very porous. Water in certain areas can move very quickly. So what we, we suspect is happening, and we've, we've seen some of these interferences, is that water um, from groundwater, as the barometric pressure change, it pushes out into the lake and it resuspends sand and sediment, and that contains bacteria. So the groundwater, and you heard this morning about PFAS and some immersion contaminants, um, states like Michigan have done a lot of work, but in Door County, there is a lot of interaction between surface water and groundwater, in particular, if you live near the lakes. Um, it's just closer, and because of that sort of unique geology, it provides uh, interesting avenues uh, for water movement. So um, we're going to go through both of these. So what I'll leave you, um, you know, with this thought as we go through this, what goes in must come out. So you know, we've got our simple house here, um, and we've got our water well and our septic tank, all on site and contained. Um, and then we have something like this would be Sturgeon Bay or Sister Bay, uh, where you've got you know, water that's been treated, comes into the house, and then you've got wastewater pipes. Um, and then also make sure we understand that we also don't have combined wastewater and stormwater pipes anywhere in Wisconsin except Milwaukee. So there's no combined sewers. <laughs> They're not supposed to be combined anyway, um, anywhere except Milwaukee. So we have a series of stormwater uh, drains and stormwater, um, if it runs off the street and it goes down to one of those catch basins, it daylights at the end of a pipe and goes right out. And that's been one of the challenges in this county for beaches. Um, it just daylights where you know a public uh, access point is to the water. There's really no treatment to any of that. Um, conversely, uh, all the wastewater, so black water and gray water that's uh, used in your home, toilets and sinks and so forth, goes off to the wastewater treatment plant. So um, here's just really briefly, we're not going to spend a lot of time, but municipal uh, drinking water. Uh, so you've got some source, you know, in this case it's surface water. Uh, you have to remove what? Particulates, bacteria, what we heard about uh, uh, hazardous algal blooms this morning. So, you know, if you have well water as your municipal source, do you have to worry about harm, harmful, al uh, harmful, easy for me to say, harmful algal blooms? No, it's in the groundwater. Do you have to remove uh, sediment and solids? Not much, how, would, how much bacteria? Not, not, not too much. I mean, so you can see all the things that are out in a lake, as clean as it is, the city of Oshkosh gets its drinking water from Lake Winnebago. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine, um, but it starts out green and comes out nice and clear at the end. So they have to remove all of that material. So you can see why it's advantageous uh, for municipalities to use well water if they can. There's a lot less treatment. So they settle out things, um, they chlorinate it. That's uh, the, the typical disinfection method, and it provides religious residual chlorination through the system. Uh, there's some sort of distribution, so a water tower uh, or some place that adds pressure to that system, typically is water tower uh, is what's used. Um, and then it comes out in your faucet. So when the power goes out, you still got a lot of water in your water tower. Uh, you turn the faucet on and, and water flows out. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, in Door County, uh, we don't have a lot of municipal systems. This is actually um, from the EPA's website and it's the number of wells in an area. So if you look at the darker the color, the more wells in a particular area, sort of geographically. Um, and so what do you notice about the areas that are darker? This is more people, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just more populated. So that's really what this is kind of showing you. The wells out of the 800,000, I still can't find a number about how many wells are in Door County itself. Um, but it's a lot. It's thousands, and I'm, I'm guessing 10,000 or more. Um, but you can see that they're concentrated on the bay side and it's really just due to population because you don't have every business, home, anywhere that there's water, again, outside of Sister Bay, has a well to serve it. So if you just drive through any little town, you know, through Egg Harbor here, every one of those businesses will have a well casing sticking up out of it. So uh, what do you need for safe, reliable uh, uh, well water? Uh, you need to have an aquifer that has uh, ample yield. You have to be separated from contamination sources. That's mostly surface water and, and, and septic. Uh, you have to monitor it on a routine basis, maintain it. Um, you have to complete a sanitary well, and we'll talk about that construction in a minute. Um, and uh, you know what makes it vulnerable? So flooding, buried wells, uh, too close to septics, uh, sewer lines breaking, poor construction. You know all of these things are possibly uh, things that would lead to uh, microbial contamination of a well. 
So the three types of wells uh, that are, uh, are utilized for, for drinking water are drilled, driven, and dug. And I have a big, you know, red X there. So what's a, what's a dug well? Could you dig a well in Door County? <laughs> it, would, it would take you a long time. Uh, out, <laughs> outside, you know, you, you, you look back in the 1700s and they have the little, you know, uh, house with the bucket and you lower it down. Those are dug wells. I could go outside my office in Winnebago County with a shovel. I'm, I'm old now, so it would take me longer too. But um, I could just dig a hole and I would get water. Would I want to drink it? Probably not. Um, but they're by far the most unsanitary and they're not legal in Wisconsin anymore. Um, so uh, most of the places in the U.S. would not allow this um, because they're just not, you can't get deep enough to get into um, really clean uh, aquifer water and also they're prone to surface contamination. So what we, we are uh, left with is drilled and driven wells. Um, anybody uh, seen a driven well before? So this is what it looks like here. I don't think here, it, it, that's what it is. It's a sand point, so there's not a lot of sand here, right? But maybe there are places, uh, maybe near the lake, where you could probably do this. But if you go to central Wisconsin or northern Wisconsin, um, it's totally legal. You can install them. You can go down to the local hardware store and probably for 200 bucks and a sledgehammer, you can put a sand point in and you can put a pitcher pump on the top and you'll get safe, reliable drinking water uh, as long as it doesn't freeze. And they're completely legal as long as they're 25 feet or more. In counties, um, so for example, where I live in the, in the Fox Valley or up here where you have a lot of bedrock and, and uh, very um, uh, prone to contamination, there's special casing requirements for various reasons. And wells are typically, like where I live, my house well is 220 feet deep. Um, in that area, they're all 200 plus. In this county, they're two, three, 400 feet. Somebody even told me they had a 700 foot well. Yeah, and, you're, and you pay to put those in by the foot of steel casing. So that's, that's an expensive well. Um, so we've got drilled, driven, um, and this is what it looks like. So this one's nicely painted in blue. So if you see that well casing sticking out of the top of the, uh, out of your yard, that's really the end of, of your well. Um, and it looks something like this um, as it goes through the bedrock. So this is a sort of cartoon of that sort of karst geology, you know, cracks and fissures. Um, and essentially it's like uh, that Plinko game, something comes down and it goes like this and it works its way down. Um, and so uh, you can have sinkholes and other things, but basically you have to extend that well casing as far down as you can uh, to either eliminate or uh, greatly decrease the odds of anything moving through that, that geology uh, into your well. Um, so this is, this is a, again, a kind of a picture of that cracked um, and fissured geology. And you can see like kind of a sinkhole and you can see more fractures. And the sediment is sort of settled in here, right? You can kind of see it filling in these fissures. So if you put in a couple wells, like you just have, you don't, you don't really understand what the geology looks like. You put in a well here, wow, that's pretty high yielding well. I can pump a lot of water out of that, uh, no problem. I put one right over here, lower yielding well. So which one would I want to use more? High yielding well, right? But what's the problem you see potentially with this scenario? Termination. Yeah, everything is like a bowl. Everything on the surface is running here, all the, oh, even everything here. Oop, I hit here and then I run over and now I'm all of a sudden in this well. So um, the more water you get out of the well oftentimes will be a function of how much cracking and fissuring because the water has to move through that subsurface uh, porosity. Um, and so the way it works is you've got your well casing and there's some grout on the outside, but you have a screen on the bottom or it could be open. Sometimes they're not even screened. And your well pump actually pumps unlike a sand point which draws water from the surface up uh, under negative pressure. Your well pump is actually in the bottom of your well and it actually pushes water back up into your house. And so that forces it under positive pressure from the bottom. So you're really drawing water in here and anything that's up in this area, the upper layers of uh, that subsurface are not drawn into the well, or they shouldn't be. They should be sort of isolated, and you should really only be drawing your uh, good drinking water from the bottom, uh, from an aquifer that um, uh, makes more sense. So in our case, again, where I live, there's two different aquifers, and they're separated by an uh, impermeable layer. The top layer has got a very high level of arsenic, and so as water has been drawn down, it's just a natural part of the geology. It oxidizes and then it ends up in people's drinking water. So they have to case all the way through that layer, through this sort of confining layer, and into a lower aquifer that's lower arsenic. 
And um, so that's what the requirement is. The other reason that that's important is if there was ever anything that happened on the surface, um, you know, fecal release, if there was some sort of accident or spill, um, it would take longer or longer time to travel all the way down and filter through all this uh, subsurface before it got to your well screen. If it's a fecal material, the pathogens, et cetera, there's more likelihood that they would die off in the time that it takes to get there. Um, and it in, uh, improves the chances of getting uh, basically clean water from a microbiological standpoint. Um, and then when you get that water into your home, this is kind of what it looks like. So uh, I don't know if you can see this really well, but you know if you're on municipal, you have a well meter. Um, I did look like I, it's really, uh, my life is really not too exciting because I got all excited when I looked in the closet of my room last night and there's a water meter in the closet. And I'm, I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> my, my wife's like, you, you really need to get out more. Um, <laughs> So the water comes into the building, um, you know, it might have a softener, you've got your hot water, and then hot and cold water kind of goes to all our fixtures throughout the house. But then we have a number, you know, we've got a vent stack, and so uh, you have to have that, otherwise everything would be siphoning. And so then you've got things like, um, you know, drains, sinks, bathtubs, et cetera, and all that water then flows via gravity out some pipe in your basement, unless you might have, um, you might have a pipe that would leave out the wall of your basement, Anybody have that where it's like a little bit higher? Um, and you could have an ejector pit in the basement, which basically lifts it up and then pumps it back out. But it's all gravity. So when they say stuff rolls downhill, it's literally what it is. Um, so it all rolls via gravity out of the building. And then for that, you need a permit uh, to uh, discharge things. So this is a Door County soil permit. Um, so you have to apply for either a holding tank, which are illegal in some states, in Wisconsin, they're legal. There's a lot of them in the county uh, for various reasons, or some sort of private on-site uh, treatment system. And this is this is really the most simple type of system. Uh, we've got our uh, you know our, our commode here, uh, and it's jettisoning into a septic tank where solids and other things uh, settle out. Things like fats, oils, and greases, anything that um, might cause problems, are separated out. And then again, gravity into a typical. Uh, infiltration bed and, it, and what happens then is you've got just liquid coming through here you've got decreased pathogens in your septic tank um, you might have some nutrients in here but then it filters through that soil um, and that infiltration uh, provides a sort of natural purification for that water which then re-enters the water table and is re-accessible for you if the groundwater is moving in this direction. If the water is moving in the other direction, your fecally strained water will be available to your neighbor um, to drink. So this is a very simple diagram. Does anybody in the county have one of these systems? Oh, well, there's just a traditional septic system? All right, so that I have not seen one up here, but there's very few of them in Door County because of the small amount of, of uh, uh, soil on the top of the bedrock. Um, but this is kind of how it's done. Uh, there's a big hole that's dug. Uh, somebody goes in and looks at the different soil profiles and can determine uh, infiltration rates. They used to actually dig holes and they would dump water in there and they'd call it a perk test and they'd watch the water sort of percolate through and do the time. Uh, now they just get in the hole, they dig some holes and they look at the soil profiles and they can kind of tell uh, what it's gonna do. I had one guy um, jump into the hole and he grabbed a little bit of soil and there was a student standing there and he grabs the soil and he puts it in his mouth. <laughs> and she's like, oh, and, uh, and he's like, mm, yeah, that'll be good, that's good. <laughs> Okay, and then sign off on. But you know, if you know what you're looking for or want to taste, uh, I guess that's what you do. So this is your septic tank, again, in, in just um, uh, a little bit more detail. You always have, uh, at least in modern systems today, like an inspection pipe. Uh, many old septic tanks don't have this. Um, what are septic tanks typically constructed of? Concrete. What else? Steel. Plastic. So there used there was a big push to put steel one in steel ones in for a while because it was less expensive and they were lighter. You can move them around. What's the problem with steel? Yeah, they corrode. They rust out. Everybody remember in the early 90s or late 80s, you know, all the gas stations. What did they have? They had all steel, you know, tanks for their uh, uh, petroleum. That didn't work out too well either. Now most of the time they're concrete, but uh, the resurgence of plastic. Um, fiberglass has really helped. The problem with plastic is 
um, or places that if they're not installed properly and things thaw and freeze, thaw and freeze, um, they move, rocks and things move and can actually puncture those. But in some states like Michigan, there are areas where they require you to put in plastic because of the pH of the soil. It actually corrodes the concrete. Um, even like steel, like we use steel casing for our drinking water wells, they use PVC. So um, there are places where that's better. The other reason that plastic's better, I can go drive down to the fleet farm and I can go buy a septic tank and put it in. And there are places that that's completely legal. As long as you have a plan and you know, the homeowner can install it per you know, an approved plan, um, I cannot move a concrete septic tank. That's something that, you know, uh, <laughs> you think I can? Yeah, I lift things up and I put them down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a plastic tank here, uh, here's another set of, this is a, a septic tank and then a pump tank and we'll talk about that in a second, but this is kind of what it looks like when it's being installed and uh, you know then these get all covered over and then you know somebody puts a nice little planter over the top of this so it can get pumped out every three years. In a mound system you have a septic tank normally which would then just go to your drain field and everything's gravity just like in your house. The problem with that is if even a wastewater treatment plant, so if you're in Sturgeon Bay and you live uh, on the north side of town, where's this treatment plant in Sturgeon Bay? On the water. Well, it's on the water because they discharge into the water, right? But it's also on the south side of town. So do you think that that's the lowest point? Like if I flush my toilet on the north, no. So what has to happen is there's a series of lift stations. And I don't know how many are in Sturgeon Bay, but in every municipality, things roll downhill, they get into a big tank, and then when it fills up, it's pumped up to another level, and then it rolls down and up, and, and then it works its way over to the wastewater treatment plant. In, in your home, if you don't have enough soil here to do this infiltration, like in, on my property, I think there was like two feet. 24 to 30 inches of soil, it's just outside of Bailey's Harbor. So there's not enough soil here to infiltrate properly to treat that material before uh, it hits the bedrock or the groundwater. So what we do in a mound system, and this is actually developed in Wisconsin, so that a lot of people outside of Wisconsin call it the Wisconsin Mound. Um, we take the water that comes out of our septic tank, there's a separate tank next to it, which has a pump in it. And that pump is called a dosing pump, and it actually pumps uphill into that mound and that mound basically adds additional material usually sand and some good material for infiltration uh, so the materials pumped into there there's small pipes with little holes and it provides more optimal infiltration so if, if I had four feet of topsoil on my property I would be able to then infiltrate uh, and it would get you know sort of proper treatment before it hit the groundwater if I have two feet my mound then has to accommodate that additional two feet to give it some treatment. So really all that's in that mound is a pipe that comes from your dosing chamber over to the mound. You can see like this diagram here and then a series of small uh, pipes in that mound with uh, holes in it. So as the pump doses into the mound, it, inf it, it sort of uh, infiltrates through the mound and then through whatever's below it. Um, small bits at a time. So while the septic tank um, here, going back, Every time you flush the toilet, a little water comes in, a little water goes out. It just keeps going all the time. In this particular case, uh, it pumps, whenever it gets to a certain level, it pumps and doses the, the uh, mound, and then it stops. The pump kicks off, and then uh, you know, it sort of slowly fills up. You're taking showers and washing your hands and whatever else, and it slowly fills up. Pump, val or pump uh, switch kicks on, doses the mound again. So sometimes you'll notice uh, mounds will have uh, co green colored grass on the sides or um, you know it depends on how they're constructed and what you put on it but um, if people um, you know don't have it infiltrating properly or uh, maybe there's some solids that get into it and plug pipes or plug the infiltration it'll start infiltrating horizontally and start coming out the sides. In theory your mound should look just like all the rest of your grass. If it starts drying out, sometimes you'll see that on top because there's a lot of sand, it doesn't hold moisture. Or if you see really green sides to it, that's probably an indication that it's the short circuiting a little bit. Um, and so this is kind of a, you know, sort of a summary of that uh, kind of complete system. And when you have failure, I just, <laughs> I, uh, I, I golf in a Monday golf league. And so this is, these are pictures we took. So here's another one, here's a drain field. I'll get to the golf in a second. So you can see where it's nice and green, and that's where the, 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 the uh, systems are. This is <laughs> top, you can just see water flowing in 
uh, the top. Here's a vent pipe, and you can just see the water oozing out of that. Um, so this concrete top, by code now, they have to have a, a chain and lock on it and everything so kids can't get in it. I was golfing on Monday, and I walked out of the clubhouse, and I'm like, I'm like, what the heck? And I looked, and there was like the top of the septic tank, and it was all water all around. Well, it wasn't water, but it liquid all around it. And I, I told the manager, I said, you know, hey, I think you got a problem. He's like, what do you mean? It's just water. I'm like, really? Water doesn't smell like that. And he's like, ooh. Um, so you can, you can usually see it pretty well. Um, you can see, even if you don't see the liquid, you can see all the dead grass, right? So all the nutrients have just killed the grass off. You see a little bit of water there? <laughs> this is the worst part, right? Um, and, and whenever you have a backup, it find, you find the lowest point in the house. I've been in a couple houses where the, the floor drain in the basement is actually the highest point in the basement. How would you know? You don't know what you don't know. And I, and I love the sense of humor. This is my favorite one, the stool bus. Um, uh, so some of the, yeah. No, but this is my favorite one. Uh, this vehicle is filled with campaign promises or whatever. Um, but I just think this, I was driving down Highway 39 now, and this is number one in the number two business. And I was trying to take a picture out the front window, and my wife is like, what are you doing? You're going to hit the back of that. I said, hold on, I got it. And I, you know, and it's like my kids were really young, so they weren't driving, luckily, and they don't remember that. But yeah, I just think it's funny. I mean, if you deal with this stuff, you've got to have a sense of humor. So um, when, you look at, when you look at municipal sewer then, so we've got private on-site systems. When you look at municipal sewer, again, we've got our sanitary sewer, and we've got our storm sewer. Um, and you know, everything kind of comes out of the house. Um, and you'll often find roots and things, um, you know, kind of infiltrating into those pipes. They're all supposed to be sealed, uh, but they're really not. The sanitary sewer is placed uh, generally below the storm sewer. Again, that way if there's any sort of leakage. Um, and I mentioned the CSO issue. And so this is kind of what it looks like from a side view. So you'd have your sanitary sewer um, at a lower elevation than your storm sewer. Um, and, uh, you know, the homeowner is generally responsible for things uh, from here to the house. Now the one thing you notice in here that um, people don't often think about is there's a sump pump here, right? And so there's sump pumps that people put those hoses out in their yard and that's kind of unsightly and you got to move it every time you mow. And so what do people do with their sump pumps? They, yeah, they put them in the sewer. They're supposed to go out, like in new construction and places that you build now, they have storm sewer that it goes in and you know it won't freeze and that's great. Other people, it, it's more difficult because that infrastructure is not in place so they hook it up to um, you know the sanitary sewer they don't think about it it's just going down the drain well what's the problem with that so in the city of Oshkosh the municipality's got an 8 million gallon a day uh, wastewater treatment plant when it rains it's like 25 million gallons a day so can it treat all of that effectively not at all but what's a large amount of that Sump pumps, it's clean water from sump pumps that people have hooked up and they're just getting rid of it in their homes. Um, and so even at relatively dry times, they can watch water go up and down. So there's a major sort of push in a lot of municipalities to de disconnect sump pumps from sewer and just educate people. Because I don't think people are doing it on purpose. They just don't understand where the water's going. And oh yeah, mine just pumps every once in a while. Uh, but yeah, but if you have all of a sudden you have 70,000 residents all doing the same thing, that's a lot of water. Um, and this is what a sort of municipal uh, wastewater plant uh, looks like. This is a city of Fond du Lac. It's a, it's a very modern uh, sort of plant. Um, and you have an influent pumping station. And this is literally the lowest point um, as we talked about everything going downhill. Uh, we have primary clarifiers, aeration tanks, final clarifiers, anaerobic digesters, uh, some sort of disinfection. They use UV, it could be ozone or or chlorination, um, and then uh, you have a backup generator. Why do you need a large backup generator? So, yeah, so if, if the power goes out, does the plumbing stop flowing? <laughs> no, so it all comes, this is the lowest point, right? And I think I've got a picture of it. This is what it looks like. I was sitting here with some students taking a, well, taking this picture and talking about it, and all of a sudden we're talking about all the stuff that goes in your sewer. And uh, they're like, oh, come on, how does that stuff get in the sewer? And all of a sudden, a two-by-four came flowing in there. 
You guys know how a toilet works? I don't know if, you know, it doesn't, so it was probably a construction site or somebody had something open and it just kind of fell in and flows in there. So anyway, but all sorts of, you'd be amazed at the stuff that goes down the drains, but this will literally fill all the way up. So when it gets to the top of this six foot pipe, somebody's basement down the street probably has a floor drain in their basement that's higher than that. And then everything starts backing up down the, down, you know, upflow, I guess. Um, so it's important to have a backup generator so you can pump stuff out of that, whoops, out of that through, this is the, <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, this is right before lunch. This is like this gritty sort of cake material that kind of gets pressed out. It's all the solids and stuff that aren't going to go through the process and then it goes into a dumpster. It's really kind of gross. Um, but uh, uh, then all that material, once it gets, goes into the influent, it's pumped up with a pump and then the rest of that plant is all gravity. There's really no more pumps. There's aeration pumps and things, but it's all gravity flow through that plant. So you just have to run that one pump, basically, at the influent to pump it up and then let it flow through the plant. So you've got primary clarifiers where you're letting things uh, sort of settle out. Uh, and so it's like a big uh, swimming pool, I guess. And uh, you know, water flows over these weirs and, and the solids settle out and scum's kind of skimmed off the top. Um, then you go into secondary aeration tanks, and these are actually uh, large, like, like fish stone. So it's aerobic. It's, I think wastewater treatment plants are one of the most sort of fabulous things. I know, again, I don't have a life. But you're using all sorts of microbiology to, you know, one set of naturally occurring organisms to get rid of pathogens and other organisms and biochemical oxygen demand and all these other things. So you're basically using biology in a very sustainable um, sort of uh, harnessed way to kind of do what you need it to do. And in this case, um, they bubble water in there or air in there, and that air provides bacteria that are facultative with the ability to reduce the basically the strength of the waste. And if you fell in here, you'd sink to the bottom. Because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh-huh. Um, but it's so, you, you have no buoyancy because there's so much air in there. And to give you an idea of how fast that air is used up and how, I mean, there's huge blowers that pump that in. You can see this side of it right here and you don't see any bubbling. This actually just has the aerators turned off and all the bacteria scrub all that oxygen out and it goes completely anaerobic and they use that in, in a denitrification to get rid of nitrogen, turns it into gas, but they use it up literally within seconds. That's how fast those microbes go. And so in here, you're encouraging microbial growth. They're getting rid of the strength of the waste. Um, the waste then moves. This is, oh, you can see the kind of bubbling here. So this is in those basins. Then it heads to a fi final clarifier. Uh, the final clarifier, basically all those bacteria and things that are doing, you know, you've, you've harnessed them. In Wisconsin, I mean, think about all the microbiology that we harness to do good things for us. This is one, right? Can you guys think of any other examples? <laughs> yep, yeast, you can, I mean, what other profession can you harness millions of living organisms to service you? I mean, the beer industry, cheese, what else? Sauerkraut, wine, soy sauce, all of these things are made in Wisconsin. So again, unless you're a plumber, <laughs> that's, you know, there's a lot of ways you can use microbiology to, to help you out. So all of that bacteria that you're growing, uh, then has to settle out here in your final clarifiers. It has to get disinfected. They use UV light, so they're big, huge light bulbs that basically go in the water, it flows by there, that disinfects it, um, and then it's discharged, in this case, to Lake Winnebago, um, and it looks something like this. So all wastewater plants are, you know, are uh, situated on some place where they have a, a receiving water to put it in. Most of the time, they don't discharge into, like, for example, uh, Ephraim, I would guess, um, or, uh, uh, no, Bailey's Harbor doesn't. They don't discharge right into the lake. They discharge into a small stream or something that then discharges into the lake. So there's a small amount of separation. What's that? It goes right in Ephraim. It goes straight out to the bay. Okay. Yeah, a lot of them will discharge like into a small creek that'll be a few hundred yards away. Um, and then you have the biosolids that are left over. So all the solid material. Um, those go through an anaerobic uh, decomposition phase, and so uh, that's basically to reduce size. These are sort of, they have two different sets of them there. Um, and then you dewater it. So the biosolids that are left are still about 70% water, 70, 80% water. So why would you want to truck all that out uh, and get rid of it? 
Uh, so you digest it, you produce some methane that runs, uh, you know, the heaters, blowers, maybe some of them produce electricity with it. Um, the sludge is then uh, thickened um, and then heads back out to uh, a farm. And so this is a, actually a dump of municipal biosolids, so nice dry kind of cakey material. They have trucks that just sit there and it kind of feeds that cake in there depending if it's a centrifuge or belt press or whatever. Um, this is what oftentimes people see. So this is like a manure spreading operation. You don't see this with human biosolids because of the volume. Imagine 8 million gallons, I just use Oshkosh as an example, 8 million gallons a day, and if you know 90% of that is water, that's a, it's just too expensive. That's why they dewater it at the plant. Where manure, they don't put all that infrastructure in, and they don't have the same volume, so then they're land applying that manure. Um, and the biosolids then are separated into what's class A and class B. Anybody know the, the class A are ones that have been treated, they meet strict pathogen guidelines, they're okay to apply to food. Um, I bet you in this room, most of you guys have bought a municipal biosolid product. Malorganite. So malorganite is the, it's from the city of Milwaukee, uh, and it's the single most successful biosolids production operation probably in history. Um, and guess where they sell most of it to, or where it goes? What? Door County? What? Golf courses? Actually, the citrus groves in Florida. They send it on rail cars down south because it's so sandy. And, uh, it, but it's a great product. They have a little bit of problem there because it's municipal, so they have metals and other things in there. Um, but a lot of other municipal plants produce a Class A material too. The other one is Class B, and these solids are then applied to agricultural lands, but there's restrictions on how much they can add to it. There's pathogens that are in this that um, can't come in contact with hum food for human consumption and so forth. Um, and so just kind of uh, to refresh, uh, this is really your cycle, right? So you've got, um, if you're, you're home, this is again my little well with a bucket. Um, and you've got your septic system, you've got some sort of infiltration or percolation through that subsurface, hitting the groundwater, it moves back to your well, and it's sort of this, law, it's this cycle. And so it's all intimately related. Even if you have a municipal, um, if you have a municipal uh, wastewater plant, you think this is going to impact you maybe? Absolutely, the water you discharge into the bay or into a local receiving area. So all of these, these things, your drinking and wastewater are connected. And so um, there are a number of links from your source water to your wastewater. Uh, climate plays a big role in, in water resources. And so whether it's water levels and groundwater, we heard Val talk about the temperature of Lake Superior increasing. All of those things play uh, important roles in drinking water as well, because as lake levels, again, with the interaction in Door County between surface water and groundwater, as lake levels go up and down, that influences what's available in your well. There are places in northern Wisconsin that are just spring-fed lakes. And they went for a number of years in drought conditions, and lakes were 10, 15 feet low. And people's water wells that had been put in in the 50s dried up. And so as that groundwater went down, and you know, now all of a sudden they're back up, and now people are having all sorts of well problems because that when the water goes back up, it brings stuff with it that wasn't uh, necessarily natural. Um, again, wastewater disposal can be um, you know, publicly uh, private on-site treatment um, or municipal, um, and both the withdrawal and the treatment have to work together. And even in cases where, in, in theory, this should all be orchestrated and things should work really well. You do everything right, you put you know, the right well in, you put the right septic in, everything should work perfectly. I think there's many examples in Door County where you do everything the right way, uh, and even then you still have some problems because there's unique things to consider. Um, and for those, you have to just be vigilant. And so the one thing I always tell people uh, as it relates to your drinking water, how many people in here have had their well water tested anytime recently? Well, that's pretty good. That's still less than half the room. Um, but people forget about it. I haven't had my well water in my house tested in five years. I'm sitting here telling, I'm like, you know, don't do what I do, just do what I say. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs>